I grew up without my father. He left my mother when I was about four years old. And my mother has to work as a maid in the capital of Chile, Santiago. So I grew up with my grandmother and my uncle in a in the countryside, in a village. That was my my youth until I was 18. Uh, it was very sad, very poor life. Uh, I didn't study much because in those times the people didn't go to, to school for a long time. I actually wo I was one of the unfortunate person because I, I went to the secondary, the first year in the secondary school. And that's helped me a lot in that time. But at the age of 13, I had to start working full time because the condition of the, the country, the poverty and everything. I remember all my friends in that time, we played soccer on the street and <clears throat> we grew up together until 18, fighting on the street, getting friends again. I think they helped me a lot to, because I, I experienced to hate people and to love the same person. So help me in life until today, I can, I rely on those times when, when that happened to me. So what part of Chile do you come from? Uh, it's, um, it's called El Monte. It's a small town about 40K from the capital Santiago. At the age of 18, I moved to Santiago because my mother, in that time, she had a hairdresser salon and she wanted to pick it up the children. I was two weeks without work and I was boring like anything in Santiago because I, I grew up in a, in a village with all my friends, all the, the people I really like it, I really love it. But uh, I started working uh, two weeks later in a handbag factory in Chile. After a while, I learned to, to cut leather, which was the maximum, the highest, the highest thing in that factory. And I worked in 13 years in that place. And my wife's uh, sister was working in that place. That's how I, I, I met my, my wife, Pat, and we gonna be married for 50 years next year. Explain what the village looks like. During the day, it was fantastic, beautiful place, and it was a, a river, the Mapocho River. It was crossing very close to where I live, and and it was very, it was a lot of crowd and the long, long road to the village, and it was the hacienda, and we call it the hacienda by El Fundo, El Fundo, San Miguel. I got good memories of those people, but all the time follow me the injustice of the poor people, because I saw so much difference. Uh, even when the, the, the patrones, the bosses, they were, they were okay, they loved them, they loved them. Still, it was so much difference. I was a rebel from, from the very early age in my life. I was very, you know, I, I, I couldn't understand why it was so much difference, you know, and I saw the poverty, the people didn't have, not even food, not even food to, to eat. And also, the, the, it was one of the main problems in that, in that village, it was the, the, the drinking. The people get drunk every weekend, so it didn't help at all to, you know, to get out of. So it's a circle, a vicious circle of the people. So when you went to Santiago and you worked in the leather factory, you, did you carry any of that kind of political feeling with you? I think so. In, when I started working in the factory, it was a very nice people there, a few guys, and I didn't realize after they, they start to come into me because I was an educated person, as I said before, for those times, I was the first year, you know, the secondary, the first year in the secondary school. I was very educated, and maybe I was because my, my uh, bringing, my bringing it was like that. You had to respect, you had to be educated, blah, 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 all the things, and I, and I was, and I was. And, and they come to me and say, why don't you join the party? What party? The Communist Party. Communist Party was Socialist Party, Communist Party, Radical Party, Liberal Party. It was party for everybody there in that country. And the people appear to me to be really nice people. And I say, no, really, I don't, I don't want it. So they start to invite me to a barbecue. On Saturday, we play soccer there in that time and then going to the barbecue. And um, they appear to me really nice people. 
And I say, why not? Mainly in that time, what we're doing, it was to fight for the petition, we call the petition, uh, el pliego, de, pliego de peticiones, petition, where we're asking to the boss, we need, we need the uh, higher wages, better condition in the factory, and I was the, the representative of the workers in that time. They chose me to be the representative. Uh, uh, that's helped me a lot because I did respect my boss and the boss respect me. Later, later in life when the, the sit political situation in, in Chile changed so much, helped me a lot because my boss put a, a good word on me because he knew me for 13 years and I think he signed me in that time to, to go to the military, it took me. And he told me, he told me that. So that was around, what, 1973, wasn't it, when Pinochet came? Uh, yeah, Pinochet made the coup in 1973. It's the first 9-11 we got it. Pinochet took it, took it over the country and it was a mess. Dangerous things happen, the family turn against you. Everybody wishes your friend yesterday and the next day they is not your friend because they keep you as, uh, away from you. They say, you are a, don't touch, don't talk to me because our record is the danger. The danger you, you represent because you represent, you are in the left wing or whatever. That thing is, is, is hurt you, hurt you so much because it, not so much the military, but the family wishes it change it. The country was a mess, so everybody is like they were preparing for something. When I meet the people, the, those people, uh, they, they were in charge of the, of the party, I couldn't do anything because I just went there, listened to people. But uh, to be honest, I never hear they're going to get arms or, or, or fighting. We can't fight against the soldier. The boss talked to me, he said, you are in trouble because they be careful in what you're doing. Please be careful in what you do. So I went to the factory, I went home, to the factory, home. All the, I used to play soccer on Saturday afternoon, and that's the only thing I do. And play soccer and going home, I didn't even go to the pub with the guys because after the soccer game, everybody going to the restaurant over there and, and have a few beer. And I just keep in, I was a, I always was a good boy. I, I didn't, they didn't need to tell me, Please don't get involved in anything, but it's follow me because I, I did belong to the to the left wing party, and I couldn't do anything about, you know. So I've been told the military went to to the factory, talked to the boss, uh, what happened with me because they wanted to take me to the to interrogation, and he said no, you don't don't take him, and so he told me that, and. My neighbors in the house, they said, you got a sort of vigilance. Vigilance, they follow you uh, when you go into the factory, when you come in from the factory, they follow you. And I say, what? They had to follow me for, I don't know, for how long? Because I always do the same thing. Until uh, I had enough, I couldn't live like that because people start to disappearing. Friends of mine, they, got, they disappear and they find they're dead. So that's when you're thinking, just care for your family. I didn't know if I'm going to find my wife and my children in, in, in home when I come in from the factory. She didn't know if I'm gonna come in the, in the afternoon or they're gonna, they're gonna grab me. We decided to uh, try to get out of the country. The Australian embassy was there. So I went there and I told them, they said, fill it up this paper, bring it straight away and I fill it up the paper and I didn't bring it. I didn't take it to the embassy. I keep it the paper because I never thought to leave the country. To me, it was, it was an honor. And then we hear the one, one of the general is coming with the troop to, to restore the order. And so I was waiting for that. Nearly a month later, I took the, that phone they give it to me. And they say, I'm sorry, this is too late. Now you have to fill it up this other form. And that form, it took me one year in Chile to, to get the, the acceptance, a medical examination, this and that, different things. And it was awful, awful. 
So for that year, you must have been terribly anxious, were you? Oh, I, I, I was eating the Valium in this year. I was walking. I had to eat Valium to keep him walking. One year, it was awful. That year, I never forget that year. As I said, I had to take the Valium from the pocket and eat him there. Oh, yes, just to keep him walking. A friend of mine, he was involved with the, with the say, the one of the police uh, department in Chile, and he was a friend of mine. He said, they're going to arrest you. They're going to, when you're going to do all the, the documentation, they're going to get you. Don't worry about that Chico. He called me Chico, uh, which is Chori. They, Chico, they're going to get you. And I was scared every time I'm going to do anything. And you had to do a lot of the passport and this paper and another one. A lot of, a lot of uh, documentation you need to get out of the country. Nothing happened. So I was all right until the airport in Chile. We were waiting with my wife in the, for the bus to come to pick it up. My wife and my two kids and myself, and it was a few other people. When I hear from the, from the speaker, they called three people. And among them, it was Ernesto Cerda going to uh, international police, which he was there in, the, in that place. So I went. Um, the other two, they went before me, so they got them into the, in, inside the building, the small building. And they, he said to me, it's no room there, so you, I'm going to interview you here, outside. It was a big guy, very big guy. And he said to me, you are not allowed to leave the country because you are accused of, uh, of robbery. And I said, I don't know. And he said, tell me your life in the last few years, your life in, in Chile. Well, I was working 13 years in, the, in this uh, uh, handbag manufacturing. I was working there, and then, and then I left there, and I worked three months. The last three months, I was doing a job with my brother, my younger brother. I was working in a, because he got better money there, and I thought I was going to get better money here, so I need it. No, he said, you, you, cannot, you are not allowed to, to leave the country. And I turned around, and the bus coming to pick it up, the people to the, to the airplane, and I, I tell my wife, please go, go, you just go. And she stood there with a the kid. And after a while, the bus gone and come back. And he said, he, he swore it on me. He swore, and I can't say it. I can't say what he said, but he was a bad swearing about your mother, you know? And then he said, you can go, but never, never come back to this country. And I said, thank you very much, sir. And that was the farewell of mine. So, how did you feel when you got on the plane? Numb. I was numb. Sorry. That's okay. Did you want us to stop for a bit? No, it's okay. It's okay. okay. I, yeah. I've been through many times to this experience, and we went to Peru. The plane stopped in Peru. We stood three days in Peru in the Sheraton Hotel, which it was everything paid. I hardly don't know who paid for it, but somebody did. Probably the, the airline, he done it. And, and then coming to Australia, when we were flying, th- on Sydney in Australia when we arrived. And I looked through the window. It was so wonderful. I said to my wife, and I did promise to the people there in the airport, to my mother, to my mother-in-law, to everybody, we're gonna stay two years in Australia and we're gonna come, uh, gonna go back. We're coming back. And when I was flying there and I saw that beauty, and I said to my wife, I never gonna move up from this country. It's too beautiful. Everybody was laughing. Even the, the taxi driver brought us from the from the airport. In that time when we arrived here, I said, "Do you speak English?" The only thing I can say is yes, and I love you. And he, he laughed. He laughed about that, but it was true. We didn't speak English, and 
but uh, it was a good decision. And we, we didn't know what we we're going to find here in this country. We came to the Eastbridge Hostel in Nanawari, where we spent more than a year. We didn't want to get out of there. And at the end, they kicked you out. They said, you got to go somewhere. And so we went to the Housing Commission in Richmond. I really wanted to work. And I didn't prepare myself for the new language. And I went because through the, uh, close to the hostel where we, we arrived in, in Nanawarin, it was a lot of, a few factories around. So I went to a few factories, I asking the people, work, work. But I didn't speak English. I say work is the only word I am. And they start to talking to me and I didn't know what they were saying to me. And for sure, maybe they would offer me a job, but the, it was no communication. And, and I went back, and I went to another one and another one for two weeks and, until somebody uh, got a job for us in a, in a factory, in a big factory, uh, metal, metal manufacturing, uh, Lysax, some, uh, I never pronounce properly the names in English, Liza, uh, and they, I worked there for seven months. My older son, he was a nine-year-old. He was playing in the monkey bar, and he fell down and had a concussion. So a friend of mine helping me to take him to the Box Hill Hospital. And I thought, because he was already one year in Australia, I thought he speak, he speak English, and he didn't. And so we stood there, and the doctor took my son into the, the room and left him to sleep. But in my country, when you had a concussion, you don't let the people sleep because he said it was the belief in that time you going, you died while you're sleeping. So I was jumping into the room, waking up my son. They took me out of the, the, the room, and they explained me, but I didn't. And I told my friend, please explain to them what happened. But he didn't speak English. He was looking at me, looking at the doctor, and oh, it was awful. We spent seven hours in the hospital until they called an interpreter, and the interpreter in Spanish he tried to explain me, uh, you know, you, you got to allow him to sleep because he's going to recover. And that was awful. So I decided, no, tomorrow I'm going to the school, and I'm going to learn English. And, and I done every day, two hours of school, for a long time, I did the intensive course. I did write English, I uh, read and write English before I spoke, because it's, the speaking is the, the last things you, you, you do, especially from Spanish to, the, you know, to English. It was very hard. We created the, the Chilean community in Richmond. It was 100, 110 family. We make the Spanish school, for the kid, so they can keep it the Spanish because they're going to learn English anyway in the school. So they, they, we believe it was important to keep the language. We made a lot of party to get the money. We didn't get any grant in that time. In those times, there were no grants from the government. So we make parties and parties and whatever to raise, raise money to pay the teachers. And I was the president there for five years, five, six years in the of the Spanish community. I was working in the, they took me in the board of management there. I did it just for the, because he was the president of the, I didn't, I went to all the meetings there, but I couldn't make any, you know, any input. I learned to drive a bus. I took the, the, the heavy, heavy, to take the people from the to the camping, we went to Docks, Anglesey, Turkey, a lot of camping, a lot of single mother, and a lot of unemployment people were there. Very rough people in, in the housing commission in Richmond. It got a very bad reputation in that time. But to me, they were all friends, especially I drive the bus. So it's, I became a very good friend with them. I didn't care we're going to the pub to drink a couple of beer with them. So we, we speak the same language. <laughs> All my life I've been trying to be in touch with people to help, to help and get help because I don't want to be alone. 
that's the problem I got. I don't want to be alone. So I tried to get involved with people. And here in this, this city is a lot of good people who want to do a lot of things for the, especially with the, 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 the pensioner, you know, the people who are alone in their home, that they haven't got a, anybody because the, the children grow up, grandchildren grow up, and they've got better things to do than be around the old people. You were saying earlier that you can understand the experiences of all migrants who have been through a traumatic situation where they had to leave the country. You fear for your life. You, you fear not only not, you don't fear for your life because I didn't. I was fear for the life of my wife and my kid. That's that's the thing is moving you to do the extreme move because that's. I understand exactly what's going on with these people, you know, with the, 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 the situation in the, uh, around the world at the moment, because it's not only in Australia, but this happened around the world. I understand them. I can't even watch it, uh, television because it's made me so sad. And, but I do understand what happened to them. I went, we went through. We went through the whole thing. The migrant situation is a very, a very tricky one, but uh, my experience, I tell you, that's what I think about the, my, my experience as a migrant and be around too many migrants, many, many migrants, because in, 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 in the hostel in Nanawari where nobody speaks English, so I saw all what they think, what they're doing, so I got a, a, a big experience with migrants. And, and then in the housing commission, to, to be the bridge between the migrant and the, the Aussies one. They always criticize, yeah, but they are unemployment, they are lazy bugger, they are here. They, they always find things to separate the, you know, say, hey, man, we can have a good, a good day together. It doesn't matter what, they, what they're doing. You're working or you're not working. We are human beings. Thinking about uh, what happened to us, as I said before, I remember my, my, my uh, young life together with my friend still there in my memory. I playing soccer with them, still I playing soccer with them sometime. And I remember my family, the river, the channel, those trees, the wonderful tree we got, the one I used to jump. And all, all the life, you know, the beautiful girls, because all girls are beautiful, and all the life. Coming to Australia, coming to Santiago, to the capital where I met my wife and the people up there. I've done a lot of things, which is I, I don't regret. If I had to choose again to do it, I think I'll do it exactly the same. I will do it exactly the same. <laughs>